All right, welcome to uh, lecture six of ECE 165. Um, so as we discussed in the last lecture, we introduced this new concept called logical effort. And while we were learning about this, we were a little unclear as to why we were even talking about logical effort. We introduced a whole bunch of new terminology, all for computing delays, which we already really know how to do using our Elmore models. So why bother? Well, the reason that we want to study and, and learn about logical effort is so that we can learn how to uh, compute and optimize delays in multi-stage delays in multi-stage networks. Okay, so what does that mean? So let's consider the following example, example one in this lecture. Let's consider the fact that we have, or the example where we have an inverter. That inverter is driving some sort of NOR gate, which in turn is driving a NAND gate, which then drives another inverter, which drives some sort of load capacitance. And further, let's assume that the input inverter size is of size 10, the output load capacitance is of size 20C. Now keep in mind, when we say 20C, what we mean is it's 20 times the capacitance of a minimum sized NMOS transistor. So we're normalizing all of our capacitance numbers to our minimum sized NMOS transistor. Same thing is true for the uh, input capacitance of the inverter. So in other words, the uh, total input capacitance uh, C in is equal to 10 C. Okay, so we want to be able to compute the delay. We want to be able to calculate the minimum delay through this network or through this path, okay? Now, in this particular problem, we know the size of our uh, inverter, we know the size of our load, but let's assume we do not know the size of our intermediate gates here, okay, of our NOR and our NAND gates. And therefore, the question is really, how do we optimize the delay? So the question that we're asking ourselves is, find x, y, and Z to minimize delay. How do we do that? Okay, so what we're going to see is that we're going to be able to use logical effort to our advantage here. Uh, and, and it's gonna be a very powerful way in order to not only compute the delay through, through arbitrary networks like this, but also find some optimal in terms of delay. So when we start with looking at this with logical effort, the first thing we can do is, well, we know the uh, G terms of, of, of all of these gates. We know what the uh, logical effort is of all of these gates. So we can just go ahead and directly write that down. So G, logical effort of an inverter, we know is one. Uh, logical effort of a NOR gate, we know is five over three. We can look this up in our table if we like, if we don't remember, or we can quickly re-derive re these numbers. It's not all that complicated, okay? Now, what else do we need to compute logical effort? We need to know the parasitic delays. Well, we also know all of these uh, for, the, um, for all of these gates. And then finally, we need to know the electrical effort, or H. Um, in this case, we don't know the electrical effort of any of these gates because we don't know what the loading factor is. So H1 is actually equal to X over 10. The H of the, or the electrical effort of the NOR gate is Y over X. Electrical effort of the NAND gate is Z over Y. And the electrical effort of the final inverter is 20 over Z, okay? So in order to solve this problem, we need to be able to compute all of these electrical efforts in order to uh, compute the overall delay through this network. Now, what we're going to introduce in order to do this is we want to further introduce two other concepts. One is called path logical effort. Okay, and what this represents is the total logical effort of the path. So we call this big G or uppercase G. And the definition of the path logical effort is just the uh, multiplication of all of the individual logical efforts of all of the individual gates. 
So we can go ahead and just directly compute that. Uh, we have the inverter 1, 5 over 3 for the NOR, 4 over 3 for the NAND, and 1 for the inverter, for the final inverter. So our path logical effort is equal to 20 over 9. Similarly, we can also derive something called the path electrical effort. Okay. So as you can imagine, the path electrical effort is going to be equal to big H, or uppercase H. And uh, rather than the multiplication of all of the, um, uh, of all of the individual electrical efforts, um, we can recognize that the definition of electrical effort is the, um, is the ratio of the external load capacitance to the input capacitance of the driving gate. Okay? And so for a path, we can just say, well, that's going to be equal to the output capacitance of the path divided by the input capacitance of that path. Okay, So in this case it's equal to 20 over 10, that's load capacitance divided by the input capacitance of, of that first inverter there, so that's equal to 2. Alright, so we're, we're on our way to being able to build ourselves uh, some sort of uh, optimization for this circuit. So, but what we really want is not necessarily just G or just H. What we would really like to compute is the delay along this path, which is uh, we need F to be able to do that. Um, but before we do that, let's just take a, a, a brief aside. Okay, For logic gates, for individual logic gates, lowercase f is equal to lowercase g times lowercase h. For paths, we can say that big F is equal to the uh, multiplication of all of the little f's. But given that we have big G and big H, can we just say that big F is equal to big G times big H? That would be convenient. However, the answer is no. And the reason is because since path might branch out. Okay, so to understand why this uh, would be the case, or why this uh, impacts how we do our analysis, let's consider the following example. Let's label this as example two. Let's consider a scenario where we have an inverter, and it is driving two other inverters. Okay, so the fan out of this inverter is two. This is not an uncommon scenario uh, in digital design. Uh, most of the times we have inverters driving more than one logic gate, for example. So let's say that the first inverter in this chain here is called INV1, and it has an input capacitance of 5, and it's driving two other transistors of input capacitance 15, both of which are driving output networks of 45 unit capacitance. Okay, and let's further consider that we are only interested in this path here. We don't really care about the delay through the upper path. So let's go ahead and, and, and compute our, our, our um, logical effort parameters here. We know that G is uh, 1 times 1 is equal to 1. That's pretty easy for an inverter. H, uh, we're interested in the bottom path only. I'm sorry, that should be 45C. Um, so that's 45 is the output capacitance over the input capacitance of the path is 5, so therefore H is equal to 9. So then we can say, is F equal to G times H? Well, if, if it were, that would be equal to 9. However, this is not the case, and we can verify this. We can say, well, we know that F is actually equal to the multiplication of each of the individual F's. So we can go ahead and do uh, that, that calculation right now. So the first F is, again, little g times little h of that first inverter. h of that first inverter is uh, 15 plus 15 over 5. We have to take into account the capacitance of that other inverter. Although we're not interested in the output of that path, it certainly does affect the middle of this critical path here. Then we multiply by that, that by g, which of course is just 1 for an inverter. The second inverter there, its uh, electrical effort is 45 over 15, again times the logical effort of 1, and that gives a uh, overall effort of 18. So that's different than our big F equals big G times big H of 9. Okay, And just for your notes here, let's just write this down. Here, 
INV1, that first inverter, is driving both paths, not just the path of interest. So in other words, we really need to take into account what's happening on the inside of this circuit. Uh, and the reason that this doesn't really happen um, if we just consider big F is equal to big G times big H is because big H is the el path electrical effort which only cares about the, out the end points of the path, the, the beginning and the end. Okay? It doesn't take into ac account any of the parasitics or any of the capacitance on the inside. Now, some of that capacitance is taken into account you know, when we consider the parasitic delay and the effort delay uh, of the gates themselves. But if we have additional gates, say this upper inverter here, that is not really taken into account when we're, when, we're, when we're doing that computation. So we need a different way of taking it into account. So to do this, we introduce what we call branching effort. We'll call this B, okay? What we'll say is that the branching effort for a single node on the path is equal to the capacitance on the path, on the critical path, plus the capacitance off that critical path, but connected to it, divided by the capacitance on the path. So our, in our example above, we had uh, 15 units of capacitance on the critical path. We had additional 15 units off the path. So therefore, we can make this computation. It's 15 plus 15 divided by 15. And so therefore, the branching effort is equal to 2. Then what we can say is the path branching effort as what we're usually defining our, our path efforts to be is B, our uppercase B, is equal to the multiplication of all of the lowercase b's. Then we can say that the path effort, the total effort of the path, big F, is of course equal to the sum of, or the multiplication of little f's, but more easily, it's equal to big G times big B times big H. Okay, so very good. So let's continue our example one. And let's do this computation. Big F is equal to 20 over 9 times branching effort is 1. We can go back to that path and say, what, are, there, are there any outputs of these gates that are driving more than one gate that's not on the critical path? The answer is no. Uh, and so therefore, the branching effort is equal to 1 times the uh, electrical effort. And we get a total effort of the path of 40 over 9. Now. What's interesting is we actually couldn't compute f in the normal way. In, in, in other words, we could not compute the multiplication of all little f's because we don't know the little h's, because we don't know the sizes of all of the devices in, in our circuit. So this will be, this, this uh, is an important point that we will discuss in a minute. So let, let's just file this away in our brain uh, and take a, a short, um, detour, uh, or branch, if you will, pun intended, um, and talk about path delay. So what we can say is that the delay through the path is, as you might expect, the delay through each logic gate, or in other words, the sum of the delays of each logic gate. So from our logical effort definitions uh, in the previous lecture, we know that the delay through each logic gate is equal to the sum of the delay, the uh, um, effort delay, and the parasitic delay. Uh, in other words, we have you know the delay of a gate you know that's self-loaded. That's the parasitic delay. In addition to loading effects from other gates in that network. Okay, and so we say that uh, we can represent sum of f i plus sum of p i as two different variables. We'll call that d f plus uppercase p. Okay. And so what we'll say is that df is the path effort delay. And uppercase P is, as you can imagine, the path parasitic 
delay. Okay, very good. So we've introduced a whole bunch of uh, concepts, new variables now. Why are we doing this? So let's summarize uh, the big result here. So the result of all of this, and this being logical effort. So why are we doing this? We seem to be introducing a whole lot of complexity for no apparent reason. Well, you know, there's always a reason we introduce things in class. So what we can first recognize is that big F is constant is constant regardless of sizing. That's very interesting. Remember our, our initial path that we calculated this for, we didn't know the size of these internal gates. And yet we could compute, we know the, the logical effort of each of the individual gates, so we can compute big G. We know the input and the output capacitance, so we could compute big H. And further, we know the branching. I mean, it doesn't branch anywhere. Uh, and so therefore, B is, is 1. And so as a result, we can compute big F. This was independent of the sizing of the uh, actual uh, gates in the circuit. So let's just write that down for your notes. In example 1, we we did not specify sizing of the middle gates but we could still compute big F okay so therefore we understand that the uh, parasitic delay, or rather the uh, effort delay, uh, df, which is equal to the sum of all of the individual uh, efforts of each of the gates, is minimized by making all gates have gates have the same fi. Now why is this the case? Well this is a, a classic optimization problem uh, since big F is equal to the uh, multiplication of all of the individual gates or in other words the, the multiplication of all of our gates is constant then the way to minimize the sum of these individual multiplicands is to make them all the same. This is a classic optimization problem. Okay, so what we can then say is that if they're all going to be the same, then the following formula should hold true. Fi is just going to be the same across all states uh, or all stages, so we can just call that f hat, which is of course gi times hi, is going to be equal to big F to the power of one over n. Okay, where uh, n is the number of logic gates in the path. Okay, so there's n logic gates in path. Okay, this is a really important result. What we're saying is that if we can compute f, which we were able to do in example one, then we automatically know for the minimum possible delay what each of the individual f's should be. Okay, so we can then say that the, then the minimum if we were to design our circuit correctly, the minimum delay of our circuit is equal to D equal to sum FI plus sum PI is equal to capital N F to the 1 over capital N plus sum of PI. Okay. All right, so this here is the key result. I'll put a little star here. I'm going to say this is the key result of logical effort. So in other words, what this says is that given a path, you can compute, if you can compute big F as a result of being able to compute big G, B, and H, then what that implies is you know what the optimal little f is, the optimal effort delay for each gate in that path in order to calculate the minimum delay. And further, you don't even need to size the gates. 
you already know what that minimum delay is. You can think of this as kind of a lower bound in terms of the delay uh, achievable in your circuit. So this is a very key result. So based on this result, I'm going to uh, uh, introduce what I'll call a logical effort design methodology. Okay, so in this methodology, step one is to compute all of the logical efforts for each gate and then determine H and B. Hopefully the input and the output load capacitance are specified and then you'll be able to determine H right away. And B, you should be able to determine uh, by looking at, at, at the structure so long that it's a reasonably low comp complex structure. Okay. With this information, you can then compute big F, which is equal to GHB, and then set each gate to have FI is equal to big F to the 1 over N. Then step 3 is to say, well, FI is equal to GI times HI. We know what GI is, and further we know what this uh, uh, multiplication is. So we know GI. So solve for HI, which gives us each gate size. And furthermore, it gives us each gate size for optimal speed through the network. Okay, so following this methodology, will result in optimal speed. Now there's a caveat here. This is given the class convention models. So of course the class convention assumes we have a 2 to 1 ratio in our uh, NMOS to PMOS. It assumes that uh, we have linear proportion of delay to sizing of transistors, which of course is not strictly true in design. Uh, but still, this gives us a pretty good idea of how this, or how we can optimize uh, paths of circuits. So let's go ahead and, and, and look at example one again. Um, let's continue this for the third time and, and let's actually solve and, and, and complete the problem now. So let me uh, just redraw out the uh, structure here just uh, for completeness. So again, we had our inverter driving our, our uh, NOR, driving a NAND, driving another inverter, which drove some sort of output load capacitance. We said that the input capacitance of our first inverter was 10, input capacitance of our NOR, X, NAND, uh, y and final inverter was Z and we needed to drive a capacitance of 20 C. Further we had our uh, logical efforts here G1 is 1, G2 is 5 over 3, G3 is 4 over 3 and G4 was equal to 1. So we recall G was equal to uh, 1 times 5 over 3 times 4 over 3 times 1 which is equal to 20 over 9. B is equal to 1 H equal to 20 over 10. That's just the load capacitance over the input capacitance, which of course is equal to 2. Uh, and therefore, big F is equal to 40 over 9. So then what we can say is that, well, let's set F hat, or the effort of each gate in this path to be equal to big F to 1 over N, which is 40 over 9 to the power of 1 over 4, which is about equal to 1.45. All right, so now we know the optimal effort for each gate in this path. So let's go ahead and start with the, the last inverter of size Z there. 
we know that H4 is equal to C out 4 over C in 4, which is equal to 20 over Z. Furthermore, we know that G4 times H4 should be equal to F hat, which is equal to 1.45. So therefore, H4 is equal to 1.45 over G4, which is equal to 20 over Z. Well, we know G4, we know what 20 and 1.45 is, so we can solve for Z, okay? So we solve for Z, Z equals 20 times 1 over 1.45, that's equal to 13.8. Very good, okay? We can similarly do a similar computation for H3, that's equal to X over Y, or I'm sorry, that's equal to Z over Y, equal to 1.45 over G3, Solve for y is equal to 4 over 3 times 13.8 over 1.45, and that's equal to 12.7. And finally, h2, y over x, x is equal to 14.6. So therefore, we have just solved the... Um, sizing for this circuit, and furthermore, we have optimal delay through this circuit. Now what's interesting, and, and this is very typical in this class, is that we can check your answer to see if, it, if, it's, if it's correct. How do we do this? Well, we know that h of our first gate is equal to x over 10, and uh, because g is equal to 1, we know that h should actually be equal to uh, f hat. Uh, and so if we take x, 1.46 over 10, that's 1.46. Well, that's actually pretty close to f hat, okay? Now, there's a small rounding error here, um, but I think this is uh, pretty good for um, the uh, final answer here. So what you may be interested in is, is we've spent a lot of time talking about gate input sizes. Well, let's talk a little bit about uh, the, this, this gate design, okay? So what we mean is uh, consider that inverter that we talked about with input size of, uh, of 10. So this means that the input capacitance in total of the inverter is equal to 10C of minimum sized, min sized, and MOS devices, okay? So what that means is we want to design an inverter and we are designing the inverter to have equivalent um, uh, size to you know, our, our, our unit a size inverter according to our class convention. So that means the NMOS device has size X and the PMOS device has size 2X. And therefore what we're saying is that the input capacitance, which is X plus 2X, where 2 is per our class convention, X plus 2X has to equal to 10. Therefore, x is equal to 3.3, okay? So you have 3.3 size for the NMOS and 6.6 .6 size for the PMOS device. Now, what about our uh, two input uh, NOR gate? We said that was size, uh, let me just write it above here, 14.5. Well, how do we, how do, we do that here? Um, so, well, what does a NOR gate look like? Well, it looks something like this. We have two PMOS transistors in series followed by two NMOS transistors at the base of the circuit here, okay? And so, what is the total input capacitance of this uh, NOR gate? Well, the input capacitance is going to be the sum of the capacitance seen by one of these transistors and, and, and the other. So in, others, in other words, this, is, uh, this should be uh, size one, this should be size 1, this should be size 4, this should be size 4. So what we can say then is that the total input capacitance, uh, C in, is equal to uh, x plus 4x. And that's supposed to be equal to 14.5. So therefore x is equal to 2.9. Uh, and that means that the uh, NMOS sizes are equal to 2.9 and the PMOS sizes are equal to 11.6. Okay, so that's a fairly straightforward way to do that computation. All right, so now that we have this, this really interesting toolbox in terms of logical effort, I'm going to introduce another topic that I'm going to call optimal tapering. 
And what this means is that sometimes it's necessary to drive a big or large capacitive capacitive load for example some uh, long on chip wire on chip wire maybe some sort of IO pad a power amplifier maybe we're designing RF circuits uh, which use a lot of digital circuits these days uh, etc okay how to best so, so obviously, if we have uh, you know some sort of small inverter on our chip, that small inverter is going to have a pretty high impedance, and therefore the RC delay of that of that high resistance uh, hitting a or or trying to drive a very large capacitor is going to be uh, very slow. Okay, so what we'd like to do is is design some sort of inverter chain uh, and increasingly upsize our devices in order to increase their effective drive capabilities. So, how to best design this inverter chain. Well, let's consider what the inverter chain looks like. We have V in, and presumably it's going to go through a, a, a size one inverter, or, or sorry, uh, in this case, I'm not drawing the numbers inside the, the device, so this is just inverter number one, inverter number two, um, inverter number three, and I'm trying to draw these increasingly bigger, all the way to inverter number N, to drive some sort of output load capacitance. So this is CL and this is V out. Okay, so how do we want to optimize this circuit for the maximum or rather the minimum delay? Well, as you can imagine, the best way to do this is to use logical effort. So let's use logical effort. Okay, so what we know here is that we know H, it's CL over CN. We know big G, well, that's just equal to one, we just have a bunch of inverters. B also equal to one, and so therefore big F is equal to CL over CN times one times one. Okay, so for optimal delay, for the fastest delay through the network, we want to set F hat is equal to big F to the power of 1 over n. Then we can compute the delay. That's a very poor then. Then the delay is n f to the 1 over n plus sum of pi. Uh, now sum of pi for, for inverters, we know that p or the parasitic delay of an inverter is just equal to 1. So that's equal to n f to the 1 over n plus n times P, where P you know, should be equal to 1, but uh, we're going to uh, actually uh, do this in two separate ways, so just bear with me for a second. So this is the actual optimal delay of the network. Now what we don't know is how many inverters we would like to, to, to use in this uh, tapered inverter chain, and furthermore what the stage effort of each inverter should be. So this is an optimization problem. We want to choose the minimum delay. So let's uh, take the derivative of the delay with respect to the number of stages and set that equal to zero. So this turns out to be a, a, a the derivative looks something um, as follows. It's equal to p plus f to the one over n plus n times one minus one over n squared to the power of f one over n times the natural log of f. We can uh, simplify that a little bit. That's equal to p plus f to the 1 over n minus f to the 1 over n natural log of f to the 1 over n. So interestingly, what we're seeing here is we're seeing a lot of these big f's to the 1 over n. Now, that term should look pretty familiar to you. That should be equal to f hat, right? Recall, f hat is equal to f to the 1 over n. Okay, so let's go ahead and, and simplify this. This is p plus f hat. In other words, it's the stage effort of each of our uh, uh, gates here, natural log of f hat. 
So let's consider two cases. If p is equal to 0, so in other words, we are ignoring diffusion capacitance, then f hat, we can actually just uh, solve this to, to be equal to 0, uh, or the, the above expression is equal to 0. It turns out that f hat is equal to e which is 2.72, blah, blah, blah. Okay, so that's a pretty interesting result, actually. If we ignore diffusion capacitance, then the optimal tapering size of our circuit is equal to E. Now, if uh, P is equal to 1, which is more realistic, the inverter does load itself, after all, and we can again solve for F hat, and F hat is equal to 3.6. Now, of course, we have to solve this numerically. But computers are good at doing this. Okay, so what this means is that f hat, which is the optimal stage effort for each one of the gates in, in this logic path, is equal to 3.6. So then what we can say is that the optimal, assuming uh, p is, is, is 1 of course, the optimal number of uh, stages in our circuit is equal to log base f hat of big F. Okay, so this is a key key result of this uh, this whole logical effort um, design methodology. Okay, so let's go through an example, and, and hopefully this becomes a little bit more clear. So let's say our output uh, load is, is is 200. Our in capacitance is one. So therefore, big F is equal to CL over CN times one times one. That's equal to 200. Okay, if P equals 1, then f hat equals 3.6. Okay, so then we can compute n opt is equal to log base 3.6 of 200, and so that equals 4.1 stages of logic. Okay, so great. So our optimal strategy here is to use 4.1 stages of logic. Now, I don't know about you, but I don't know how to design 0.1 stages of logic. So what, we'd, what we're going to have to do here is round to 4 for design. Okay, We can only design integer stages of logic. Then, if we do that, f hat, and I'm going to call this near optimal, because it's not strictly optimal, um, although it's optimal in the sense that it's the best that we can do, uh, is equal to f over 1 to the n, which is uh, 200 over 1 to the power of 1 quarter, that's equal to 3.8. So pretty close to, to, to our f hat, okay? So given an, an n of, uh, or rather f hat of 3.8, then we can go ahead and directly design our logic path. We have an inverter of size 1, followed by an inverter of size, well, 3.8, followed by another inverter of size 14, and then 55. driving a load of 200C. So in other words, each stage is capable of driving, and, and this is in its optimal condition, uh, a, a next stage load of about 3.8 times higher than its input size. Okay, so the lesson here, the lesson is that it is often best, if, if you need to design a tapered stage of logic in order to drive a big capacitor, it's often best to uh, taper stages by uh, somewhere between three and four, okay? And this is actually really important. You'll be amazed at how many times in design you actually have to do this for I.O. pads and long wire traces and, and, and things like this. Okay, so this is really important, and it is something that, that I would like for, for, for all of you to remember, even well after this class, if, if you ever stay in digital design or, or have to do digital design at some point in your career, you should really remember this. The optimal tapering between stages is somewhere between three and four. Now note, of course, you know, this is hand analysis. We're making a lot of assumptions here. We really ought to verify this. We really should verify with simulations. 
that are going to give you a much more accurate picture of what's going on here. But this is an excellent rule of thumb that I do highly encourage all of you to really try and remember uh, moving forward.